This is Anstruther, but here people don't call it Anstruther, they call it Enster. Over the burn there is Wester Enster, here is Easter, and it's part of the royal borough of Kilrenny, I would call it, but they call it Kurrenny. So it baffles me, when you look at the map, the words are quite different from the words they speak here. But the extraordinary thing about this place is, wherever you go, you get the feeling that the past is always present. The language of the people seems not to have changed. The only thing that's changed, really, is that once everything depended on fishing here, and this is no longer true. I'm going to explore up there, and that's where the past is always present. And there's a very interesting bit. A way back in the time of J King James V, he was trying to cross these stones, and they're often underwater. And this particular day, he came up, but he wasn't wanting to be recognized as James V. He was dressed as a beggar. He loved to do that. And a beggar woman recognized him, kilted her skirts, and carried him over. And the result of that is a club was set up called the Beggar's Benison. It had 32 members, and they were devoted to drinking, dissipation, and gambling. In the time of King James V, the street nearest the sea was called Fourth Street. In 1690, it was carried away with all its buildings in a great storm. So this is now the front, and this opening leads to High Street. Look at the way they used to build their doorways in the old days. You'd hardly see a better example of a moulded doorway. 1718. And this is a manse which is even older. 1703. And various inscriptions beside it, I don't know what they mean, they're rather strange. And there's supposed to be a secret passage that leads to the garden. There's certainly a great feeling of the past about this place. This is where Captain Kay lived when he held the clipper ship record on the run from Gravesend to Hong Kong. He did it in 83 days. Bucky House. This was built by a 17th century merchant, but the shells were put on as rough cast by a tradesman Slater by the name of Alexander Batchelor, who advertised its attractions thus. Here is the famous grotto room, the likes not to be seen in any tomb. Those who do it wish to see, it's only threepence asked for fee. Now, the 16th century kirk is on the site of an even earlier one, and a stone coffin outside it is said to have floated over from the Isle of May, bearing the body of St Adrian. That's the legend. The truth about the kirkyard, with its burn, giving easy access to it from the sea is less savoury. In body snatching days, it was too handy. Thieves were seen throwing their booty into a boat below them in the real burn. And it caused the beadle to say when he heard of these goings on, Wheel, I'll tell you this, there's no a living soul will be taken out of my kirkyard. <coughs> Anstruther has always depended on the sea for its livelihood and the time of greatest prosperity was the herring boom period of the 1880s, when the harbour was thronged with sailing smacks, and three and a half thousand men and boys were at sea, and half as many again working ashore, gutting, curing, barrelling. As many as 9,000 barrels were coopered in a day by 76 tradesmen at that time. I'd like to have seen Anstruther then. Unfortunately, there's not much of a stir now. And when I asked about the fish sale, I was told that there wasn't one. That the craft nowadays is mainly lobster fishing. The harbours get outdated because fishing boats have got bigger and the focus of fishing activity has moved northeast to Peterhead. Tom McBain, you've been fishing the waters of the Forth all your life. Has it been good for you? Well, yes, yes, over the years it has been good. We started way back in uh, 1938, the first year I started my father the, the winter heron fishing. And at that time, as you know what I mean, there, there was a lot, lots of people employed in the, the heron fishing at that time. But over the years, the, the heron gradually disappeared and we had to adapt ourselves to seeing that fishing. And that involved getting uh, bigger boats, travelling further afield. Uh, but predominantly, as you see it, the waters round the, the, the May Island. That's been the best waters as far as we've been concerned. You were never worried about starving? 
never really worried about starting. We had our good times, we had our bad times. Sometimes, you'll, you'll, probably some winters, you'll get prevailing easterly winds, which is very bad on this coast. We've had those bad years. But overall, I can truthfully say that uh, it's been good to me. Yeah. Now, this is one of the best harbours in the whole of the east coast of Scotland, and yet it seems to me to be vastly underused. Well, I suppose the answer to that, if, if, if the region and the government are prepared to spend money, you can make a harbour any place. And that has been the problem. There hasn't been enough development in the central belt of Scotland, harbour-wise. Well, well yeah. you are the representative of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation for this part of the country. You represent how many fishermen? Oh, 250 or 300. So you'll be fighting to get that, what you've been telling me we about? We are. We've been fighting with the region since ever the, the region came into being. No success yet, but we haven't given up hope. And if ever a town deserved it, I think it's this one. Well, I, I would say that, yes. It's got a long, long past history of the, in the fishing industry, and it's a pity it should just go to museum pieces. These whale bones facing East 4th Street are from the jaws of the biggest whale ever caught in the Arctic. And just along from it is Cellar Dyke. There's always been competition between this place and Enster. The rivalry between the two towns has been virtually continuous, and even at school, boys would fight with each other. It used to be nets that were hung out to dry, but now it's washing here, the salt air is said to make them whiter than white. The red pantiled roofs date from the time when boats from the low countries of Scandinavia traded 400 miles across the open sea to Anstruther. They carried the tiles as ballast and dropped them off, sailing back with coal and linen. Whatever you do in Anstruther, the Scottish Fisheries Museum overlooking the ancient harbour is a must. Part of it on the right was a 16th century abbot's lodging. And what a fascinating collection of stuff. Not a dump, but just the way fishermen leave things lying about. The fishermen were allowed to dry their nets there and the gear of ropes which are part of them. In return, the abbot and the monks got a hundred salt fish from every barrel of herring they caught. A good return, because in these days, salt herrings were more highly prized than salmon. Hard to believe, but it's true. Richard Weems is the curator. Did I gather from somebody that it really showed fishing all over Scotland, not just the east coast here? That's correct. We've been... Uh trying to display methods of fishing used all around the coast as well as boats and the uh, way that people lived. Now you're pretty young to be the curator of a place like this. How did you come to be here then? Well, I started working here when I was at school and uh, as a part-time job, uh, weekends, summer holidays. When I came to leave school, the chance of the assistant curator's job came up and uh, I grabbed it the chance and uh, the trustees were pleased to take me on. And when you came here, what kind of work did you actually do? We've done a lot of work from restoration through to displays, setting up displays, and uh, I've painted a mural on one wall and uh, done a bit of work on a figurehead. You actually rebuilt that figurehead? A lot of the figurehead, yes. It was rotten. It had been lying in the garden for 30 years, and we had to rebuild it. Well, it looks very smart now, and that's an old brain steamer, Caledonia, or Claymore, is it? Claymore, is a, uh -huh. yes, it was broken up in 1931. Now, how about all these models, Richard? How do you get them? A lot of them are donated or loaned from enthusiasts. Many men have uh, spent time on the actual boats that they've made models of. You certainly get the flavour of the whole history of fishing the ocean in this museum without the smell, which it seemed in the great days of the herring fishing was so powerful that it pervaded the air for miles.
An early description tells of the herring overflowing and the sturdy women, knife in hand and barricaded with herring barrels in a bustle of hum and fish. The women worked so fast, gutting 60 fish a minute, that they needed the bandages on their fingers to avoid cuts with the sharp knives. There's plenty of realism here, which make the model seem alive. Stuff keeps coming in the whole time, is that right? Yes, we get stuff arriving almost every day. Uh, maybe not so much valuable stuff like paintings, but always stuff that's handy, useful to put on show here. So gradually it's accumulated over 15 years? The museum, when it opened, certainly never envisaged uh, a collection this size anyway. Through the stormy seas and the living game just to earn your daily bread, your day run. Though the hours are long and the kicks are men, still you follow in the shores of heaven. Oh, well, I earned my keep and I paid my way, and I won the gear that I was wearing. Though I used to sleep standing on my feet, Still I dream about the shows of hell.